Hello, this is the 3D Total Podcast, and my name is Paul Hellard. Today, I called into the home studio of Nicholas Cole, one of the Los Angeles-based contributors of 3D Total's book, The Beginner's Guide to Digital Painting in Procreate. Nicholas Cole is a, a freelance illustrator, comic artist, and character designer, sketching brilliant work for Guerrilla Games, Blizzard Entertainment, Disney, EA, <laughs> and many other companies, mostly from his home studio. Well, we couldn't talk about any of his professional work due to several NDAs, but we soon got him talking about everything else. It's a lot of fun. Have a listen. Nicholas Cole, great to hear from you. Um, what's been happening in your world? Oh, just the usual. Um, freelancing for my pajamas, uh, you know, getting started late in the day. <laughs> <laughs> in your pajamas. You were saying before it was a freelance uniform. I completely understand that. <laughs> That's right. I'm usually up pretty late nights, but um, you know, things have been actually really good. I'm, I'm working a lot of contracts, um, and I think pretty much none of them I could name or talk about because I'm under yeah. several different NDAs. Yeah, yeah. And your clients read like a who's who. That's uh, fairly impressive. Well, thank you. Um, it's been, I mean, it's been over 10 years at this point, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So right tell me, time. with your character designing, you're um, digging into uh, an immense imagination of uh, children's stories, that, uh, that young adult sector. Tell me more about oh. them. For sure, yeah. No, I, I think that, you know, just having grown up uh, in the heyday of, like, the, the 90s mascot platformer era um, and the comics and, and video games and entertainment uh, at the time were all kind of aimed at the people my age um, when I was a kid. And now I think increasingly, like, things seem to be aimed at that growing group of adults. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess I feel like I have a particular passion uh, to try and, and keep in mind that group of kids, those like kind of preteens and teens that, that like that we were once that fell in love with these things to begin with. Um, mm. And I really want to be conscious of the fact that that's that's like a lot of the, the genes as we sort of dig back into all the remakes and remasters and stuff like that, which are a, a lot of fun, but just trying to bring back the spirit of of the the time that we first encountered those things for the you know the first time ever and it was fresh and I, I think that I want to make sure there's still a lot of that in the world for the next generation of kids coming along. Yeah, yeah, it was a wonderful uh, characters like the wind fe the wing feather sagas, uh, the uh, uh, venture zone, all this gorgeous lighting. You've really you've really nailed it. Oh, thank you. Thanks. It's funny. I, I started out um, initially working in kind of a MMORPG, kind of, um, you know, uh, World of Warcraft adjacent kind of uh, video game space. Yeah. And yeah. found that, like, the work that I was doing uh, at the time was kind of skewing kind of more sort of 20-something, 30-something, uh, as video games sort of uh, tend to do. And I found that, like, the, the I, I kept getting jobs because of the portfolio work I was generating, Um and it was pulling me further and further away from the heart of that um, younger audience. Uh, and I think that I, there was a moment when I started to realize, like, you know, I kind of want to, like, take a proactive role in shaping my portfolio and showing people uh, what I want to do. Um, okay. So I think, you know, some of the, like, rendering and lighting stuff comes from, you know, sort of the training, you know, sort of classical stuff and doing a lot of, like, really, like, rendering heavy jobs early in my career and then using that now to kind of uh interpret sort of uh, more colorful and playful designs it's yeah. kind of a yeah that's just the uh, even those little key images like the uh the, that blue orb um uh, lighting up the face and the little wizard uh image the the port the porco rosso lighting his pipe uh, all that sort of stuff. I'm just looking at your front your front page. It's just like uh, gorgeous stuff. Um, all backlighting and the big hob uh, spread. Um, what sort of clients what are you, were you um, able to reach across? Tell me more about your international clients, your uh, Japanese or European. Yeah, uh, actually working with a lot of European clients these days. Um, worked with a couple uh, folks on some animated stuff. Uh, it's probably still not announced but um mm. sort of access uh uh studios in the uk 
Um, and right now I'm working with uh, Guerrilla Games um, in the Netherlands. Yeah. And they actually had been made uh, the Horizon Zero Dawn series. So in terms of like very grown up skewing uh, design work, that's probably the the far limit, you know, kind of the, the world that Guerrilla has been used to, to making. And I can talk about the project itself, but I could definitely say I think that uh, it's stretching my uh capacity to to reimagine things in more detail and and uh create stuff that's more on that kind of grittier part of the spectrum tell me when you when you're conceiving of all of these uh characters and bringing in your own elements i mean you're, you're digging back into your own childhood tell me about that because uh you, you were saying you're the child of the 90s and, and video games and, and comics and such can you name some really big influences, perhaps even not just characters, but the artists that were uh, running there back then when you were a kid. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Good question. I, I think that at the time when I was a kid, I was pretty unaware of the actual artists. You know, you kind of just receive the art yeah. as part of you know a comic or a video game, and only later do you find out who that actually was or, or how they made that happen. Yeah. Um, Big fan of of Ken Sugimori, who is the watercolorist and designer behind all the Pokemon designs yeah. um, from the original series. Just amazing work there. And the earliest sketches uh, that I found much, much later, you know, that never came out, you know, when the games were originally coming out. But just looking as an adult into the process of coming up with Pokemon for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's so thrilling to see these like napkin sketches done by these these people who didn't necessarily know at the time what they were onto. Um, I love seeing that stuff. Yeah. Um, you can see their process. Yeah, totally, totally. You feel like something's being born that you know for for me was this huge influence that I would you know carry with me you know for for decades after encountering Pokemon for the first time, um, and you wonder like did they did they know. You know, did they have a sense of, of how big it could be? Um, or was it just kind of another, you know, game development gig and kind of as exciting or nerve wracking or full of possibility as any any project could be? Yeah. I have a, a set of uh, sketches I, I keep in my studio, just a print I found at some Comic-Con or other of, I think it's like the very first scribbles of Mickey Mouse. Um, oh, wow. By Walt. Uh, on like lined yellow paper and, and they're really rough um, and I just I love looking at them and I love thinking about them because I I just love the idea that there was a day just some random Tuesday you know when yeah. when he sat down and had some some scrap paper and, and came up with this idea that really captured everyone's minds for for like a generation you know yeah it's like uh, hmm, this, this might work <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> it reminds me that anytime I sit down to draw, uh, even if I don't see the fullest potential or you know what what something could be, mm. I think that you know all you can do is is your best job with the work you have in front of you that day. Uh, it is, yeah. You know, and and hope maybe lightning will strike and maybe it won't. Um, but everything that you know becomes this huge edifice this like giant you know impenetrable uh institution you know decades later started somewhere you know and, and i think that it's easy as a young artist to get intimidated and feel like you need to you know go out with this um just uh, you know huge vision actually i think you know walt really did <laughs> so it's probably a bad example he was pretty uh, pretty ambitious dude but uh but i still think you know you never really know when you're you know, cracking an icon with your work. Tell me about your passion project because you talk of uh, jelly bots and that magnificent design where they're uh, they've got the the jelly suits on. It's a phenomenal concept. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's a it's something that came out of that desire I was, I was mentioning earlier of you know realizing that the projects I was taking on and just the opportunities that were presenting themselves. Hmm were leading me in a direction that felt like it was fun, but it wasn't where I wanted to go. And I knew that, you know, if I was more proactive and put some of the work out there, if I could come up with some ideas or some visuals that started to explain to people, like, I kind of think I want to fit more here, hmm. uh, that that might be able to help, you know, begin to to demonstrate to people like, oh, maybe we should think of him differently, you know. Okay. Um, 
so Jelly Butts was was kind of one of those things. I mean, it really came out of a desire to create something colorful and bright in in kind of a sci-fi space uh, that was more optimistic. Sure. At the time, like everything that was going on um, sci-fi wise, and it still is pretty largely the case, was just zombies and apocalypses of various types. Um, and I felt like I wanted to create designs that maybe fit in a future where everything doesn't die yeah. <laughs> <laughs> horribly, you know, like all of your characters are obviously fantasy and, and such but some of them have that uh mm. what, what sort of references do you, ref, do you visit zoos do you go through uh, wildlife parks for inspiration i mean yeah no I, I literally do i i uh I, I love zoos and aquariums actually i find aquariums enormously inspiring um i realize there's a, a kind of an arc you go through i think as like a little kid you hear about dinosaurs and animals of any kind really just animals that exist and you become obsessed like oh cow goes moo amazing mm. uh never heard of that before you know it's, it's a completely novel idea and then i think for a lot of people there's a long stretch as you go into your teenage years where so what the cow goes moo it's a cow like who cares um <laughs> and uh and I think that for a lot of artists and especially character designers, uh, as we get into this later part of our lives, you start asking questions about design and anatomy and uh, you hopefully, you know, maybe something wakes up in you and you start to look at the world and realize like, this is amazing. <laughs> like it's a cow is, is crazy looking and it, it's, you have maybe in your head, this cartoon of what that is. But when you really look at an actual cow, um, it's amazing the detail and the patterns and the, and the, and the hair and the, the expressions and um, yeah. And so I think that going to places like zoos and, and, and aquariums can be a wonderful place as a character designer. If you, if you go there with a question in mind, you know, like an assignment that's bothering you, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you'll find an answer. I'm, pre I'm pretty convinced that I've usually found something that cracks it open. Yeah. Um, and a, and the cow really does go moo. It really does, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's true. It's not just stories. That's right. See um, it for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, um, you're prepping for a, a workshop you're doing in Spain in uh, late March. Tell me more about mm -hmm. this, because this this is where your uh, personal experience gets transferred to your uh, your viewers. Yeah, yeah. I was bowled over to be invited. I was really. Um, this is kind of a new thing for me. <laughs> I, uh, I've done lectures and classes before, but uh, this will be my first like three day workshop. Um, and I, I'm really excited. I, I'm nervous. I, I think that it's helping me sort of focus a little bit and realize like I want very badly to give back to the community something of value. Um, but I think that it helps that I feel like I was given a lot of value. Um, from other artists and, and teachers um, early in my life uh, as an artist. And, and so I think like it's it can be hard to like teach things or pass things on if you didn't learn them to begin with, you know, if it was just something that came naturally. Certainly. Um, but, I, you know, a lot of the stuff that I, I do was something that I had to learn. So I'm hoping to be able to pay that forward. That's awesome. So tell me some specifics. Where in Spain and uh, where can you book? Yeah, it's um it's going to be in Sevilla um or Seville <laughs> as it's spelled yeah. um uh, and it's going to be March twentieth through the twenty second I believe um and uh, if if you're interested in booking you can uh, shoot an email to info at la galleria roja dot com um and uh, I think I think there might still be open slots uh, at this point. Uh, but I'm going to be there for three days and I'm going to be walking through all my character design process, uh, talk about color and, and contrast and texture and the principles uh, of design that sort of go into creating something that really like tells a story and draws the eye and stands out in your portfolio. That's brilliant. I, I love events because you can get out and actually network and get to know the people in your industry that you never knew were in your industry. Uh, the collaboration of possibilities. Totally, yeah, and it could be a quite lonely industry too. You know, I mm. think we're all in our pajamas, <laughs> locked in our <laughs> our home offices or you know coffee shops somewhere, and uh, and doing our own thing. And it's really wonderful to be able to connect with other artists in real life. Tell me about this three D title publishing book, The Beginner's Guide to Digital Painting in Procreate. Quite a mouthful, but uh, I actually <laughs> was was sent a, a PDF of a, of a, a preset. Um, on the book and 
gee, it covers everything. Tell me your part. Yeah, no, they, they approached me uh, and I asked about, um, you know, sort of showing uh, the process of a, a fantasy character design. Mm. Um, and it was awesome because I could just kind of uh, go wherever I wanted in terms of the design and the content. Um, and uh, like I mentioned before, because a lot of these things I learned or, or had to really grapple with to figure out my process, uh, it was actually pretty easy to break it down into steps that I, I think people will be able to follow along with. Um in Procreate, I, I, I spent my, you know, formative years uh, drawing uh, in Photoshop mm. and about four years ago made the leap to the iPad full time. Um, so everything I do and I have done for the past four years, including like the Spyro Reignited Trilogy concept art um, and all my current projects are all iPad uh, from start to finish. Wow. That's, in, so, that's impressive. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, it, it's just a great tool. I, you know, I, I think that people are so surprised to hear that, you know, and it's just like, to me, it's, it's very natural and very obvious that, uh, it, that it's, you know, uh, a beautiful, like new way to, to get out and, and, you know, open up the, the world to you. So you can just like get out of the, the stuffy single room that you're <laughs> otherwise yeah. chained to, yeah. uh, and go draw. Yeah. Cause I, um, I have a iPad pro and I'm, I've just, uh, bought procreate and, a a, a, a couple of pens, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting, getting, I'm jumping, I'm on the way to jumping between Photoshop back across to uh, Procreate just now, just, just um, relieved at how simple and applicable the whole thing is. Yeah, it, it, it can feel uh, a little daunting to switch tools, especially like late in uh, your development or if yeah, you, yeah. you, know, you feel really stuck in like, oh, this is who I am and, and how I work. Um, but uh, it also can really be liberating. I find that, you know, when I switch tools, um, with the iPad, that was one. And, you know, when I move even into, you know, sculpture or into watercolor, you know, uh, you just you start to, your brain opens up in a different way, I think. And you, you're open to new uh, visual ideas and, and approaches. Yeah. And as I went through the, uh, uh, the beginner's guide, I'm realizing so much more. There's just so much to, uh, to dig into on the Procreate and the, and the iPad. Um, yeah, I would never have thought it was so complex. It's, it's just wonderful. No, they do. They do a good job of hiding it, right? They have kind of a, a really slick, kind of minimal UI. Yeah, and it looks like there's not much to it. Um, right. But I've compared it to uh, there's a, a burger place in in California called In and Out, mm -hmm. uh, and you just have to kind of know. There's like secret items on the menu that if you're a local, you know what to order, but they're not like up on the wall. Um, We've got one just down the road. I must have a look. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> toy design. You can design a, a toy character on on the pad and whip it around on your desktop and, and play with it in in three D space. There's a modern phenomenon, obviously, where the toy that you've designed on the screen has now to leave the screen and has to be physically constructed. There are some phys physics based rules you have to obey because I, I learned that when watching some great designs not make it through to three D printing stage. Because mm. they wouldn't load, they wouldn't hold together in real life. You know, two thin legs, top-heavy design. Um, mm. What's your take on that? What sort of um, what sort of rules do you need to keep in mind when you're doing toy design? It's really interesting because the way that I came into it was totally not that. You know, I, I was oh, okay. I was sort of blue sky doodling um, and came in as a, a concept artist because I think they wanted people there who also thought more loosely and didn't have the technical process uh, in mind yeah. so that, you know, you could learn and collaborate with people who understood the technical process. But the reality is that there was a lot of stops and starts because I, I was constantly designing the things just like you described, where there's just no way that they're going to work um, in a finished product. And I learned a lot. I, I saw, you know, really up close um, how uh, specific and, and, and dialed in the process is, especially when you're going to like a large scale manufacturing um, and how hard it is to control all the specifics and get that really nuanced quality you can when you're just drawing it yourself. Yeah. Uh, so definitely gained a lot of respect for the process. Yeah. Um, it's, it's almost like a, uh, a creative side of building a, a bridge in 3ds design. <laughs> yeah. It's engineering. It yeah, absolutely it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I saw the, as a, uh, an observer, I saw the, the first few, um, character designs being 
um, sprayed out on a 3D printer in LA and uh, it's at a, an early Seagraph and it was like, uh-oh, <laughs> this is not, <laughs> not going to end well. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, a, it's amazing what people can do at this point, um, the, the detail on the finesse. But it's, it's cool because the interface with the 3D printer, like a great way of showing how real the process already was, you know, yeah. like the to take a, a drawing and then turn it into a 3D sculpture digitally uh, is a really artistic endeavor. Like there's a lot of craft that goes into that. And I think some people who aren't familiar with those processes, they can think that, you know, oh, you just press a button and, and art shows up, you know, yeah. or this character is sort of procedurally generated. Mm. Um, and that's not true at all, you know. And then when you finally can hold something in your hands and you realize that someone who's been tooling around in ZBrush for, for, for weeks has really been sculpting something uh, and you print it and you can really, uh, really get a sense of that. Yeah, yeah. Talking of ZBrush. Um, you take great, great pride in the, the iPad uh, Procreate. Have you ever thought of jumping across to 3D? What's what's your uh, thoughts on that? I took a little time in 3D uh, when I originally was starting out. That MMORPG I mentioned, uh, mm. it, the way the production works, you know, the, especially as a, a young, like, entry-level concept artist, uh, I came in and, and initially there was a lot of tasks that needed doing um, that were just purely drawing, uh, purely, you know, color and ink. Um, and then over time, I was, as like a couple of years sort of uh, ticked by, it was increasingly clear that uh, there weren't going to be enough jobs for the full team uh, to, to take that on. Uh, so I wound up doing some, some 3D ZBrush work and I wound up being, it, it turned out that I was quite good at sculpting hairstyles in ZBrush. Mm -hmm. um, so I wound up doing all of the hair sculptures for the game, uh, which was some absurd number. It was like eight playable races times two sexes times like 16 hairstyles each. <laughs> it just, uh, so I paid my dues for sure. I, I definitely cut my teeth in ZBrush at that time. I, I've forgotten a lot of it because I just haven't kept up the skill. Oh yeah, and, uh, and the interface has completely changed since it's happened. Totally, yeah. yeah. This was this would have been uh, 2010, 2011. Yeah. 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 Tell me, who do you look up to? You've got uh, such a history, illustrators and designers and uh, modelers and that are bubbling around in the industry. Who 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 takes the cake for you? Oh man. Uh, it's sort of, you know, there's such a, an incredible variety of people to pick from. Um, I'm, oh boy. I mean, in terms of like big, big picture stuff, like Hayao Miyazaki is just my sure. like favorite working person. I, I love the work he's done. And I, I actually kind of relate and love kind of the grumpy <laughs> attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just something about the groundedness of the way he approaches his work uh, that I really like. Um, but other contemporary artists... Shion Kim's work on okay. Into the Spider Verse. Yeah, um, I believe that was that was Shion. Um, just amazing stuff. Uh, the the caricature, the quality of the the designs, the faces that that the uh, the characters have that each really speak to their personality so elegantly with like relatively little overwork. Uh -huh. uh, I just think they're they're killer. Uh, I saw that and I, I got the art book and it was just my jaw was on the floor. I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. uh, Nicholas, tell me tell me about your beginnings. Where where did this all start? Yeah, I came out of art school um, in 2009, um, and that was formative for me. It's it's funny you hear a lot of discourse these days about you know is or isn't art school necessary. Um, for people coming out because there's so many digital resources out there 3d total puts a lot of of really great work out there um, for people who want to learn yeah uh, and i think it's a it's a more big you know question these days than it than it used to be uh all i could say is it, while it's prohibitively expensive and i spent years paying off debt uh the experience of being with like a lot of peers and people in art school was formative for me it was really huge oh, sure. And uh, yeah, just just being surrounded by a lot of talented folks. I, I went to school with a the years that I was there. There were a number of people. Uh, Devin Katie Lee uh, was a class ahead of me, and that so was Claire Hummel. Uh, and Devin and I have wound up just working on Spyro together. Uh, Claire's off with uh, Valve these days, mm. uh, working on secret projects there. Um, 
and uh, there's a number of other artists and, and, and animators and folks that came out of that that class. Um, but it was really inspiring, you know, to be among those people. And I think it turned a switch on in me. And I, I really wanted to to keep pace. You know, I, I don't like thinking of it as a competition at all. But I think that there's something very motivating about seeing other people um, kind of just kick ass and, and do their thing. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, coming out of that, uh, I really felt like I had something to prove. Um, and uh, joined up with a company called 38 Studios working on an MMO. Um, back in the day, it was going to destroy yeah. the World of Warcraft franchise once and for all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it did not. No, uh, I it, it, uh, no well, yeah. <laughs> it went out of business and uh, it, it was pretty brutal. And in 2012, everybody lost their jobs simultaneously. And then sort of this group of really talented people scattered in every direction. Um, and that was when I realized, you know, I had an opportunity to make the leap to freelance. And I wanted to before that, but it's really hard to to move from a place of stability and comfort on your own into a place where you're just, you know, looking for the next gig all the time. And I knew I wanted to try it, but I think having things fall apart on me was like a, a wake up call. It was like, okay, I could do this right now and uh, use that as like a the boost I needed to to kick my butt into gear and uh, start, you know, just getting the ball rolling more seriously online and, and follow up with contacts. And that's, that's that it, was, isn't it? It's, it's getting your work out there and networking and um, pushing the barrow because it's your barrow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird. I, I was just talking to a couple students at a, a school here um, and uh, my wife and I actually both, both went to go speak to them. It's her alma mater. Um, and I think there's a lot of fear, you know, for young artists out there trying to square with the idea of the industry as it currently exists and what's freelance going to be like if I want to do that or, you know, will I be able to hold a job down in the industry? And you're hearing all these news articles coming through about studios shutting down and projects collapsing here and there. Um, and I, I, I think I, I see it like it is yours, yours to push, you know, um, mm -hmm. but it's also there's a large portion of it that's out of your control. Yeah. Um, and it's a bit like like surfing or, or sailing, where you can do you can do your part to like kick yourself out into the water. You know, you wake up, put on your wetsuit, wax your board, get out there. But the waves got to show up, and if there's no waves, you know, you're not going to surf that day. So you, you sound like you surf. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't at all. No, uh, I freelance, which is <laughs> it's yeah, totally the same thing. That's right. So. If you wouldn't be wasting your time surfing, that's like <laughs> there'd be problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Beginner's Guide to Digital Painting and Procreate is available for pre-order now at the 3D Total uh, site. And uh, I think it's being released not too far away, but of course you can always go online and pre-order. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas Cole, for uh, coming online for a, a bit of a chat. Uh, we've never met, but uh, yeah, perhaps one day we'll, we'll get together at a Comic-Con over in LA or San Diego or something like that and have a few beers. Yeah, I hope so. This is great, Paul. Thank you. Good on you.